word. And you should always bring your book. Let me just um, emphasize that. Open it to the forward of the second edition. If you've got the one volume edition, it's Roman numeral 22. I want to spend a few minutes on this. Um, and then we'll jump into the actual story. <clears throat> Where to begin? Uh, first paragraph. Tolkien talks about how he began writing this story and says that it was begun soon after The Hobbit. Okay but before The Hobbit was published. And then he says he didn't go on with writing this. That is, after The Hobbit was published, and he began to get letters about, you know, we want to know more about Hobbits and stuff. He didn't continue writing The Lord of the Rings. Instead, he went back to what he calls the earlier material about the Elder Days. And this is um, the material that in 1977 gets published by his son as the Silmarillion. This includes... The Silmarillion includes the earliest material Tolkien ever wrote about what would become Middle Earth. Remember uh, Thursday I put up here on the board the Old English um, half-line, Ayala Arendelle. Okay. The earliest stuff about Arendelle is what comes into uh, the Silmarillion. And so he goes on and says he began, he wanted to follow up this material, the Silmarillion stuff, for himself. And he says, I desired to do this for my own satisfaction. And I had little hope that other people would be interested in this work, especially since it was primarily linguistic in inspiration and was begun in order to provide the necessary background of history for Elvish tongues. Now, when he says it was linguistic in inspiration, he means he began writing all of these stories, all of these poems, all of these songs about these um, individuals, these inhabitants of Middle Earth, for one reason. Tolkien, as a scholar of languages, knew, which seems perfectly obvious to the rest of us, that you don't have a language without a people that speak the language. Okay? And that in kind of the history of language, what often happens is that on and this accounts for whatever language group you're, you're talking about. The earliest kind of material that we usually see is song, with, with one little exception. The earliest writing that survives, it's economic data, like receipts and tax accounts. I mean, it's really boring stuff, okay? But what we know about the evolution of language is that before people write prose like this, or before poets or authors compose prose, they compose poetry. They compose song. Okay? So Tolkien knew all that. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to give a culture, a heritage, to the languages he was creating. Bear in mind what I said the other day. When he was in the trenches in France in World War I, he was inventing languages, okay? kind of when he had spare time. And so what he wants to do is he wants to create a world where the languages exist, speakers of the languages. And so if you're going to create speakers of the languages, what do you do? You not only create the language and the speakers, but then what they do with that language. What do people do with language? They tell stories. So what the Silmarillion is, as an example, it's vastly different from this book. Has anybody read the Silmarillion? One, okay. The Silmarillion is a collection of separate, disparate tales. Some of them are not finished. Okay. You cannot pick up the Silmarillion and expect to read from the very beginning to the very end, beginning, middle, end, one single overarching plot line. It doesn't work that way. You have the beginning of the world, at the very beginning of it, and then you have this long section about the coming of the elves, and then you have this long section about the fall of Numenor, and then it ends with a note about 
of the Third Age and the Rings of Power, which kind of gives you a little entree into this. Okay? So that's what he is saying he wanted to do first. All of the Silmarillion material. When those people whose advice and opinion I sought, okay, who are those people? On the basis of what we talked about on Thursday. It's the Inklings, exactly. That's the group of writers, scholars, thinkers who met regularly twice a week, either at the Burden Baby Pub or in C.S. Lewis's rooms at Bodlin College in Oxford, um, that Tolkien was telling these stories to and reading these stories to. He says, when those whose advice and opinion I sought corrected little hope to no hope, they told him, his nickname was Tollers. Tollers, give it up. Nobody's going to be interested in that. And they were largely right to some extent. Okay? I went back to the sequel, meaning the Lord of the Rings. Okay? And it's the sequel to two things. It's the sequel to the older material that's in the Silmarillion, and it's the sequel to The Hobbit. I went back to the sequel, encouraged by re requests from readers, for more information concerning hobbits and their adventures. But then notice what he says. The story was drawn irresistibly toward the older world. So you have, let's call it, um, as he puts it, the older world, break, the hobbit, break, Lord of the Rings. Okay? This will later get published as as the Silmarillion. And he says, this gets drawn backwards to that. Right? That accounts for the difference in tone, atmosphere, feeling, all that kind of stuff between the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. Okay? Keep in mind, in terms of the chronology of how he actually begins it, this stuff starts in sometime around 1915. This begins around 1931. This begins around 1937. Okay? But as he writes this, it takes him back here, not to here. That's why The Hobbit is light and airy and silly, and the elves are silly. But the elves in here, you can say a lot of things about them, but they are not silly. They are very, very serious. Okay? The story was drawn irresistibly towards the older world and became an account, as it were, of its end and passing away before its beginning and middle had been told. Why? Because the beginning and middle are told here. So what Tolkien realizes is, I've got to fill in some of this information that's here into here in order for it to work, in order for it to make any sense. For those of you who, for example, who have not read The Lord of the Rings, but you've seen the films, how does the first film open? I was discussing how hobbits live. Okay. Oh, whoa. Key, yeah. Things. You hear Kate Blanchett's voice. And you see all this stuff about Sauron forging the rings of power and the elves, blah, blah, blah. And you see the battle on Orodruin, etc. And Isildur cuts off the finger. Okay. Now imagine none of that gets told. And all you do is you open with a party and a ring. You don't know anything about the ring. Okay. Well, just as Tolkien says, I get drawn back to this and I've got to tell the beginning and middle, he's going to do exactly that in this book. Two chapters. Give us all of that background information we need to know. The second chapter, the shadow of the past. And then in the um, second half of Fellowship of the Ring, the Council of Elrond gives us the other background information that we have to have. Okay? So he says, the process had begun in the writing of The Hobbit, in which there were already some references to the older matter. 
So the Hobbit doesn't stand completely on its own. Because we do have people mentioned in the Hobbit that are referenced here and then become important here, such as the Necromancer and Dol Guldur. Okay? We have the High Elves mentioned in the Hobbit. We have Gondolin mentioned in the Hobbit because, uh, get the name right, Bilbo gets a sword, only a dagger, but for him it's a sword, that was forged in Gondolin. Okay? Gandalf gets a sword, a real sword, that was forged in Gondolin. Well, Gondolin is a country, let's say, back here. You, you don't get any information that you really want, if you want it, about Gondolin in the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings. Okay? So he names some. Elrond, Gondolin, the High Elves, the Orcs, Durin, Moria, Gandalf, the Necromancer, the Ring. Now listen to what he says. The discovery of the significance of these glimpses and of their relation to the ancient histories revealed the Third Age and its culmination in the War of the Ring. Classic, he, he puts this in a classic way that every author uses. The discovery of these, of the significance of these glimpses. All right. Tolkien's writing the story, right? Everybody, you know, show me your way. He's writing this story. He is inventing this story. So why does he use the word <coughs> discovery? What do you do when you discover something? You find it. Okay, where is it though? It already exists. Notice that. Tolkien is saying the significance was already there. And the things that he's talking about that give us a glimpse of the back, they were already there. What was his job as author to do? To show the dirt they own. To show them. In other words, to move the dirt so that everybody else could see it. He's not approaching this like, I created this. He's approaching it like, look what I found. Isn't this wonderful? Almost I mean, uh, interviews um, and things that I've read by authors about the craft of writing, they all say this, that they don't necessarily invent, they find. And their job is to merely let the story tell itself. That the story, in some way or another, already exists, which Tolkien talks a little bit about in um, the fairy story essay, okay? So it goes on. Those who would ask for more information about hobbits eventually got it, but they had to wait a long time. How long? The Hobbit was published in what year? 36. 37, okay, actually. When was this published? 54. So they had to wait 17 years. And he talks about what goes on in that period. Okay. Um, skip a bunch. And if you're really interested in this, or you get very interested in this, you can buy the 12 volume History of Middle Earth. Okay. Which is Tolkien's manuscripts edited by his son and an uh, estate executor, liter uh, Christopher Tolkien. And he edited it and, and published these for one reason. I mean, he realized Daddy was a gold mine. Because there are a lot of people out there who would pay big bucks, and did pay big bucks for these. I mean, each volume is like, I don't remember, um, when they originally came out, like $37 or $28 a piece, 12 volumes, you do the math, and you figure Tolkien's got a built-in audience of millions of readers, okay? before, long before the films came out. That's a lot of money, okay? um, But you can buy the 12 volume and you can see how the book, excuse me, books all evolve over time. 
You can read draft upon draft upon draft of Lord of the Rings. You can trace the transformation of Strider from being originally a hobbit. Okay, think of Aragorn as a hobbit. <laughs> Take a pretty boy, Viggo Mortensen, shrink him down, fatten him out, you know, and he's got big feet and his name's Trotter, okay, to the character Strider. You know, lots of big changes with Gandalf and such also. So he talks about kind of where he was at certain periods in time. And then I want to go to the paragraph that begins, The Lord of the Rings has been read by many people, page 23, since it finally appeared in print. And he tells us why he wrote it. The prime motive was the desire of a tale teller to try his hand at one, a really long story. Did he succeed? Yes, he definitely succeeded. That would, too, hold the attention of its readers. Okay? That, you know, you could debate about. For some people, it doesn't hold their attention. It doesn't keep them. From what I hear, because there's too much detail. Too many names, too many characters, etc. Okay? But most of us say, yes, it holds our attention. That would, three, amuse them. Amuse doesn't mean to make you smile or make you happy or make you chuckle or laugh. It means it catches your attention. For most of us, yep, succeeds in that. Four, delights them. Most of us, yes. Okay. And five, at times, maybe excite them or deeply move them. Okay. I've known lots of people, and I was, you know, one of them, who, upon their first reading of The Lord of the Rings, before the films came out, at one point or another were in tears because of things that happened. Kind of like for those of you, I'm going to not going to give away anything. Kind of like for those of you who began reading the Harry Potter stories when you were 9 or 10 or 11 or 12, and each time, each year that a book would come out, you would anxiously buy it. And then beginning around book four, things start to get a bit darker. And in book five, somebody dies. Don't give any names, okay? But I remember when that fifth book came out, my kids sitting out back, both of them at that time. Did I have? I don't remember how many I had by then. I've got four. I think we had all four of them by then. Book five came out, and, you know, they're sitting out back on a swing and just tears running down their face. And I knew something was coming because I'd read the interviews and seen the interviews with J.K. Rowling. Because she came down from her writer's loft or whatever after she finished that section in the book and told her husband, so-and-so just died. Okay. little aside here, which I'll talk about more when we get to that book. When that book came out, book five, um, let's see, uh, book seven came out in 2007, six came out in 2000. So in 2003, when... Book five came out. Um, a newspaper in Canada printed an obituary of the character who dies in book five the day before the book was published. Don't mention any names. Okay. Yeah. I remember seeing it on the Drudge Report and a lot of people were very upset, including J.K. Rowling. And she has lawyers that are like, you know, rabid pit bulls. I mean, they go after people, okay? So, Tolkien says, as a guide for doing all this, I had only my own feelings. For what is appealing or moving, and for many, the guide was often, was in it, inevitably often at fault. And he tells us about what those feelings are and what moves him and excites him in the fairy story essay. Okay? 
Some who have read the book, or at any rate have reviewed it. What do you mean by that? It means there are people who have reviewed the book, but haven't read it. Happens all the time, by the way. Right? Have found it boring, absurd, or contemptible. I have no cause to complain since I have similar opinions of their words. <laughs> okay? Or of the kinds of writing that they evidently prefer. But even from the point of view of many who have enjoyed my story, there is much that fails to please. And then he goes on for some other stuff. Okay, now let me pause here for a minute. In 1961... Yeah. In 1961, Tolkien's friend, he's, they're no longer close at this point, but they are still in touch. Tolkien's friend, once his very, very close friend, C.S. Lewis, nominated Tolkien for a Nobel Prize in literature. Tolkien lost, obviously, because right? you would know if he hadn't. In fact, it wasn't only Tolkien, but there were about 30 or 40 other people nominated. And this is from an article from the UK Guardian, January 5th, 2012. The Lord of the Rings might have spawned a thousand pallid imitations, been crowned the UK's best loved book. The largest bookstore chain in England called Waterstones did a survey about 10 years ago now in which they asked, what is the best book you've ever read? And if I remember right, out of something like 100,000 ballots returned, Lord of the Rings won hands down. I mean, like nobody else was close, which really sent the literary intelligentsia, you know, jumping off the roof like lemmings over a cliff because they don't like this book. I mean, supposedly egghead English professors don't like this book okay, for a wide variety of reasons. reasons. Um, and sold millions of copies around the world, to be precise, about 250 million before the films came out. But according to newly declassified documents, like it's, you know, some super state secret, it was damned by the Nobel Prize jury on the grounds of J.R.R. Tolkien's second-rate prose. That is, his writing style. Okay? Um, when somebody gets nominated for a Nobel Prize, apparently, what the Nobel Prize committee does is they take all this information, they weigh, they evaluate it, they vote, and then everything that they voted upon gets put in a vault for 50 years. Nobody can look at it. Once the 50 years is up, it becomes available. Okay? And apparently, the eventual winner in 1961 was a Yugoslavian, excuse me, Yugoslavian writer named Ivo or Ivo Andrich, okay? Writers they passed over in support of this Yugoslavian writer, who I have never heard of, include Lawrence Durrell, who I have a vague memory of reading about, Robert Frost, most of you have probably heard Robert Frost, Graham Greene, E.M. Forster, and Tolkien, among others, okay? Any one of those, at least Frost, Green, Forster, and Tolkien, in my book, could clearly have won the Nobel Prize. I mean, Graham Greene and Ian e. Forster and Tolkien are fantastic prose novelists. In personal opinion, there's never been a better American poet than Robert Frost. Okay, But while Andrich was lauded for, quote, the epic force with which he has traced themes and depicted human destinies drawn from the history of his country, unquote, other nominated writers received shorter shrift from the Nobel Committee. The prose of Tolkien, who was nominated by his friend and fellow fantasy author C.S. Lewis, quote, 
has not in any way measured up to storytelling of the highest quality, unquote. And yet there is an entire, an entire industry that owes its existence today to Tolkien. Fantasy literature. If Tolkien had not written The Lord of the Rings, you would not be able to go, to go into Barnes & Noble or Books A Million or any other bookstore and see an entire section devoted to fantasy literature. My opinion, Stephen King probably wouldn't have written anything were it not for Tolkien. I mean, King even talks about how influential Tolkien was in his development as a writer. That was written by jury member Anders Osterling. Frost was dismissed because of how old he was. <laughs> okay? We're judging the quality of his work, whether or not he should receive a Nobel Prize. And he's dismissed because he's 87. What the few fill in the blank? Does his age have anything to do with the quality of his writing? Okay. Forster M was also ruled out for his age. Okay. Even though in 2007, Doris Lessing, at the age of 87, was awarded a Nobel Prize for literature. She was the same age as Frost and Forster when they were denied. Okay. Um, let's see if there's anything else here that's significant. Not really, but I, I wanted to just kind of point that out as in terms of kind of what Tolkien's talking about here. When the book was initially published, I mean, it had lots of negative reviews. One was... Um, Edmund Wilson has a little review titled, Ooh, Those Awful Orcs. Okay. C.S. Lewis reviewed it, and this happens all the time. You know, you get your best friend to review something, and it's very positive. I used to be on a, a, um, an edition of the poetry of John Donne's works, okay, called the Very Orm Edition of the Poetry of John Donne. And, you know, when a volume would come out, Somebody who is not directly associated with the, the um, Variorum would write a review. But it would be somebody that a member of the Variorum specifically asked because they were good friends. Okay? And the review would obviously be glowing. Okay? Well, Lewis wrote a review titled something like Tolkien and the Renunciation of Power. Get the idea where I get the theme from? Um, that's a very glowing review. But by that time, look at what C.S. Lewis had already written, which gives him a, a bit of a you know, pedestal to stand upon as an author himself. He'd written most of Chronicles of Narnia. He'd written the Space Trilogy, and he'd written a bunch of academic stuff as well. Okay, Let's go on. Tolkien says, As for any inner meaning or message... It has in the intention of the author, none. Okay, now what does that mean? What is he telling us there? That he wrote the book to fit around all the movies and stuff, but he didn't really write it for us to get anything from it other than just the story. However, he doesn't deny that there can be a movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, he wrote it simply to tell a story. He says that is one really, really long that would move people, hold their attention, all those things. He says, in my intention, as he sat down and began writing this, he didn't begin with an idea. How can I write a novel about the dangers of nuclear weapons? Okay? Because when the book was published... An awful lot of readers said, oh, the ring. It's an allegory for the atomic bomb. <laughs> Sauron is in the east. 
the good forces of Middle Earth, the free peoples of Middle Earth, the language used in the book, are in the West. It's a novel of the Cold War. <laughs> Tolkien says, horse, you fell into blank. No, it's not. It's a novel about Frodo <laughs> and Sam and Merry and Pippin and Bilbo and Gandalf and Legolas and Aragorn and Gimli and a job they have to do. Okay. He says, in the intention of the author, it has no inner meaning or message. But just because the author doesn't consciously intend a meaning or message does not mean there's not one there. How many times have you written something and somebody read it and they explained what they thought you meant and you said, but that's not what I meant. How many times have you said something to somebody and they interpret it differently? Right? Why? Why does that happen? Because we're not Spocks. We can't go up to somebody else and do the mind meld and have perfect, complete understanding of what's going on in your mind. Okay? And you can't do that with me. That would be the only way communication would be 100% perfect. Because even when we communicate, we are filtering What's going on up here as my synapses are firing, what goes on from there to my tongue doesn't always mesh. You'll see lots of times throughout this semester, I will inadvertently create what are called portmanteau words, where my brain will be going fa faster than my tongue, and I will put part of one word next to part of another word. And I'll catch, hopefully, I'll catch myself and clarify it, right? I don't intend for that to happen, but that happens. Tolkien goes on, explaining what he means by it has no inner meaning or message. It is neither allegorical nor topical. What is allegory? Story? No. Reference. Kind of. An allegory is where you have something, I'm trying not to use specific words, but where you have something that stands for or represents something else. And in true allegory, it stands for or represents only one thing else. So, for example, in one of the greatest allegories ever written, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan in the 17th century, you have a character named Christian. Guess what Christian stands for or represents? Buddhist, no. <laughs> Muslim, no. He only and always represents Christian. You have a you know, variety of things that Christian comes in contact with. You have a slew of despondency. Okay, a slew is like a pit filled with crap and mire and stuff. The slew of despondency never stands for hope or joy. It always stands for despair and depression. Okay? Get the idea here? So in a classical allegory like that, if you have somebody come in and he's got a shield and the shield has on it a big giant red cross, like in Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen allegory, written in 1590, okay, that pretty much always means this guy is a Christian knight. He's never going to struggle with it and convert to Judaism as an example, okay? That's allegory. Now why did I not use the word symbol? That something symbolizes something else. Because in symbolism, the thing that you see or that you read about can usually symbolize multiple other things. 
which is why Sigmund Freud once said, sometimes, and I should have brought one in, a cigar is just a cigar. That is, in symbolism, the symbol itself is what it is, a cigar. Okay? But it represents or stands for a variety of other things. And if you know anything about Freud, anything that is this shape always, 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 always has as at least one of its reference a penis for whatever reason. Okay, always. So it could be this or it could be a tower. And so the Twin Towers being knocked down stands for the emasculation of America. You know, I mean, he would go completely crazy with that. A sword. Get the idea, okay? Tolkien says, this book, it's not allegorical. But then he says, nor is it topical. What does he mean by topical? It's not related to what is going on in history at the time that he is writing it, okay? That's what he means by topical. As the story grew, it put down roots into the past throughout unexpected branches. He goes on and talks about how its main theme and stuff was there in The Hobbit. The crucial chapter, Shadow of the Past, is one of the oldest parts of the tale. It was written long before the shadow of 1939 had yet become a threat of inevitable disaster. In other words, he's saying that chapter, the Shadow of the Past, in which Gandalf kind of tells Frodo, War is coming long before 1939. Well, what happens in 1939? Outbreak of World War II, September 1st. Germany invades Poland. Tolkien's saying, I was writing this long before that. It has nothing to do with the Second World War. The entire novel has nothing to do with World War II. It is an accident of history that it was written at the same time. Okay? And from that point, the story would have developed along essentially the same lines. If that disaster, World War II, had been averted. Okay? The real war does not resemble the legendary war in its process or its conclusion. How did the real war conclude? What happened to Germany? What did we, the Allies, do to it? Okay, and? And it was split between Russia. Occupied it, and it was divided. Okay. What did we do to the German high command? Most of them. Not all of them. The Nuremberg trials, and then they were probably most of them executed. All of them? No. Some escaped and some killed themselves. Some escaped, some killed themselves, and some we brought over here and adopted. The creator of the V2 rockets enabled us to put Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. So the guy who's responsible for the rockets that bombed England, we brought over, made an American citizen. And he helped us develop our intercontinental ballistic missiles and the Apollo space program, Werner von Braun. Okay? Just make sure everybody gets all that clear. What else? So we essentially used Sauron's knowledge for our purposes. That's what Tolkien means. The war in this book does not follow the pattern of the real war. Okay? Because if it had, notice what he says. If it had inspired or directed the development of the legend, that is this story, then certainly the ring would have been seized and used against Sauron. Boromir would have
would have gotten his big chance. He would not have been annihilated, but enslaved. And Baradur would not have been destroyed, but occupied. Saruman, failing to get possession of the ring, would have the confusion and treachery of the time have found in Mordor the missing links in his own researches into ring lore. And before long, he would have made a great ring of his own with which to challenge the self-styled ruler of Middle-earth. Soviet Union, United States. You know, we detonate our atomic bomb in 1945. They detonate their first one in 1947, excuse me, 49, and the arms race begins. Okay? Tolkien goes on. Other arrangements could be devised according to the tastes or views of those who like allegory or topical reference. But I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations. He did not like C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. And saying he did not like is a nice way of putting it. He detested them. For one reason, he thought Lewis was too preachy. Okay. Even though Lewis, when he began writing Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, the first one that he wrote, he also did not set out with an idea. Gee, how can I tell a Christian story in a non-Christian world? Okay. He began with images that he'd had in his mind and dreams for over a dozen years. An image of a head of a great, big, huge, tawny lion and of a fawn carrying packages in the snow. <laughs> he didn't know what in the world these images were you know, plaguing him for. So he starts writing the story, and the story discovers itself. It's after he writes it that he realizes, man, people are stupid. Okay? He did write the Space Trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralander, and That Hideous Strength, with an idea in mind. And people reviewed those books. And said, oh, this is really good science fiction stuff about a guy going to other planets and didn't see the Christian symbolism at all. And Lewis realized, hey, you can use fantasy, as he puts it, to get eternal truths past sleeping dragons. Sleeping dragons meaning literary critics. Okay? So, Tolkien says, I prefer history. True or feigned? Feigned? False history, made up history, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers. Many confuse applicability with allegory. What does applicability mean? The ability to apply certain things to the story. Or, or certain things to the story to you. Yeah, turn that around. The ability to apply what you see in the story to real life. You're going to see, as we go through Lord of the Rings and the Harry Potter stuff, I'm going to do, pardon my language, a hell of a lot of applicability. Because there is an awful lot in these works that does apply to our lives and the real world. Okay, But Tolkien says, the freedom to do that resides where? Here, in me. See, the difference between applicability and allegory is an allegory, I become God. And I tell you, the reader, this is what you can understand. This is what this means. In applicability, I, the author, say, look, share. You determine what it means. You determine what it means, and you determine what it means, and you determine what it means. And what these three determine what it means may not be what the next three. Or what any one person may not determine, may not determine what it means to somebody else. Does that mean all interpretations are equally valid? No. No, not at all. Why? The interpretations have got to be based upon what is in the book. You can't read the Lord of the Rings and say, oh, it's about alien abduction. Be 
because there are no aliens in the Lord of the Rings. Okay? So the interpretation has got to follow what is there. Notice how then Tolkien kind of qualifies what he's saying. An author cannot, of course, remain wholly unaffected by his experience. But the ways in which a story germ uses the soil of experience are extremely complex and attempts to define the process or best guesses from evidence that is inadequate and ambiguous. In other words, psychoanalytic criticism, which attempts to read something and figure out what is going on in the author's mind and background and personality at the time. Is a bunch of hooey. Tolkien says, you can look at an author's experience, but to try to take that experience and say, this is what causes this in the story. That's not a wise move. It is also false when the lives of an author and critic have overlapped to suppose that the movements of thought or the events of times common to both were necessarily the most powerful influences. One has indeed personally to come under the shadow of war to feel fully its oppression. In other words, he is saying, to really understand the horrors of war, you have to experience it personally. Personally doesn't mean my father or my sister or my mother, or my brother, or my uncle fought. It means I fought. And it's always very interesting when I teach this class, when I have veterans in it. Last time I did this, last fall, I had a 20 year Sergeant Major. Okay? Um, spent 20 years in the military, okay? including Tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, his insights were, let's say, radically different from a 19-year-old's or a 20-year-old's. Because this guy, frankly, had seen things most of us will never see, and I would say should never see. Like about 15 years ago, I was teaching this at a special forces guy who was in the first Gulf War. His experiences were radically different than mine upon reading them. But as the years go by, it seems now often forgotten that to be caught in youth by 1914, Tolkien in 1914 was 22, was no less hideous an experience than to be involved in 1939 and the following years. That is, to be 22 in 1914, when World War I broke out, wasn't really much different than to be 22 in 1939, when World War II broke out. By 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. Notice long, complex sentences until you get to that sentence. He wants to zero our attention so that when we read that, it stops us cold in our tracks. By 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. So think of all your close friends. Think of only one being alive. How does that change your outlook? How does that change your experience? Okay. And then he goes on and talks about the scouring of the Shire. And says some people think that the scouring of the Shire reflects what was going on in England at the end of the war. Wrong, he says. That was an essential part of the plot from the beginning. Why? Because Tolkien knew because of experience in World War I. You can't go off from your happy little hobbit hole, allegorically speaking, let's say, off into the big wide world, see things you shouldn't see, and go back home and expect it all to be the same. 
Because even if home hasn't changed, what has? You have. You know. That's the difference between Mary, Pippin, Frodo, and Sam when they arrive back at the end of the novel as opposed to the beginning of the novel. They have changed. In fact, someone even tells Frodo, you have grown wise and merciful. Something, two qualities he did not have at the beginning. Okay. And then he goes on and talks about allegorical significance and such and says there is none. Let me make, make one comment though. When he's talking about the scouring of the Shire, he does say it does have indeed some basis in experience. The country in which I lived in childhood was being shabbily destroyed before I was 10. He grew up in a little town outside Birmingham, England. Birmingham today is this huge industrial city. And men, excuse me, the country in which I lived in childhood was being shabbily destroyed before I was 10. In days when motor cars were rare objects and men were still building suburban railways. Okay. And if you read Tolkien's biography, there is a mill on a pond, river and such, titled Sarah Hole Mill, next to Sarah Hole Pond, that Tolkien played at as a child. And that mill, that water mill, got torn down and replaced with a huge red brick mill with a big tower that was coal fired and spewed out black smoke. Now, if you're familiar with the novel, it's not in the film. What's that an image of? When, when they, they return to Shire. It's an image of when they return to the Shire and Ted Sandyman has built a big, huge, smoke-producing mill. And it is actually in the direct condition of the movie shortly. Is it? Okay. And and yeah, it is in there. And Sam is not happy. <laughs> Sam kind of represents Tolkien. Okay, let's jump in. We're not going to talk about the prologue concerning hobbits or the ordering of the Shire or pipe weed. Good little section there on tobacco. Um, finding of the ring and such. Just start with book one, and you have a map there. Tolkien was a very accomplished artist. In fact, Wayne Hammond and Christina Scholl, S-C-U-L-L, -L, have a book out titled Tolkien Ar Artist and Illustrator, which includes artwork and illustrations for The Hobbit, for The Lord of the Rings, for... Uh, Father Christmas Letters, Farmer Giles of Ham, um, Adventures of Tom Bombadil, and a bunch of other stuff, okay? And most of the maps you see here, or se some of them at least, are Tolkien's own. In fact, when we get to the section in the Mines of Moria, where they read from the Black Book of Mazarpool, where Balin has been writing stuff before the, the Balrog attacks them, Tolkien made a mock-up of that book of where Balin is recording what is going on in the Mines of Moria when he and his crew go back to kind of reset up the Dwarvish Kingdom. You go to, if you go to Marquette University in Marquette, Wisconsin, and go to the Tolkien archives there, because Tolkien sold the Lord of the Rings manuscripts to Marquette University in, I think it was around 1957 or so, to pay off a tax debt, and he only sold it for $10,000. <laughs> um, you can go into this little room and see the actual book that he created that is the book that they are reading from and it's all inscribed in and he burned the edges of the paper and he's got like blood stick not real blood but he's got stains on it and the you know the writing's all scraggly and everything and just around the room which is about a fourth this size um, are various illustrations and maps, and all stuff that Tolkien drew. 
I mean, this was how much he got into the creation of the story. It's kind of like Robert De Niro's acting. If you know anything about Robert De Niro, when he takes on a role, he becomes that role. Okay? Tolkien, kind of in some weird mystical way, really was in Middle Earth when he was writing Lord of the Rings. Okay? So we begin with the long expected party, which I'm going to skip a whole bunch of. I want to pick up where after the party, Bilbo goes back to his hole and he meets up with Gandalf. And on page 32 in the one volume edition, I hope, they're talking about the ring. And Bilbo says, about two thirds of the way down on that page, talking about he feels that he needs a holiday, a long holiday. I'm old, Gandalf. I don't look it, but I'm beginning to feel it in my heart of hearts. I feel all thin, sort of stretched, if you know what I mean, like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. Okay. Now, how old is he? He's 111. She's correct terminology. Yeah, he's 111. 111. How old is Frodo? 30, 33. Okay. He's leaving his tweens. He's come into his inheritance. The total number of the two of them added up is 144. So they invite 144 people to the party. Okay. He's 111. This is long, a lot older than most hobbits usually live. So he says, I've made up my mind, I'm going away. And Gandalf asks, you know, okay, now you've, you're leaving everything, right? The ring too? I suppose so. Where is it? In an envelope, if you must know. There, on the mantel. Oh, no, it's not in the mantelpiece. It's here in my pocket. And why shouldn't it stay here? So they talk a little bit more. And Pebble starts to get a little testy. You're always badgering me about the ring. Gandalf, no, but I had to badger you. I wanted the truth. It was important. Magic rings are, well, magical. <laughs> and they are rare and curious. You won't need it, Bilbo, unless I'm quite mistaken. Bilbo, why not? What business is it of yours? I found it. It came to me. A little difference in meaning there. Yes, yes. No need to get angry. If I am, it is your fault. It is mine, I tell you. My own, my precious, my precious. <laughs> and that really is how he ought to say it. Okay? Why? It's the impact or the effect of the ring. He is becoming Gollum-like. Or gollum light, if you want. It has been called that before, but not by you. But I say it now, and why not? Even if Gollum said the same thing, it's not his now, but mine. I shall keep it. Okay, notice. He's getting kind of angry there. Okay. Finally, Bilbo says, well, if you want my ring myself, say so. But you won't get it. I have my precious. I won't give away my precious, I tell you. And he reaches for his sword. Then, you know, Gandalf's done. He's had enough. It will be my turn to get angry soon. If you say that again, then you shall see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. And he suddenly, you know, notice he doesn't literally grow in height. He doesn't, you know, press a button. He just appears to. Okay. And Gandalf gets him to leave the ring. Okay. You had better take it and deliver it for me. That will be safest. No, don't give the ring to me. Put it on the mantelpiece. It will be safe enough there. Till Frodo comes. And Bilbo leaves. Notice no throwing the ring in the air and, you know, all those great effects. So Bilbo, uh, Frodo comes back. He finds Gandalf. We get the end of that chapter. And we get chapter two, Shadow of the Past. And how much time passes between the end of chapter one and when Gandalf returns in chapter 2, Frodo was 33, about 17 years. 
because he's about the same age as Bilbo was when he began his adventure in The Hobbit, when his adventure begins, all right? And what do we hear? That Frodo was also well preserved, all right? Sam's at the Green Dragon having a pint or more and talking with Ted Sandyman and such, and Gandalf reappears. Page 46. Gandalf was thinking of a spring nearly 80 years before, when Bilbo had run out of bag in without a handkerchief. And they start to talk about the ring. Gandalf says, about the ring. It is far more powerful than I ever dared to think of at first. So powerful that in the end it would utterly overcome any one of mortal race who possessed it. It would possess him. Now he's Tolkien has given us the end of the story. What has Gandalf just said? Any one of mortal race who attempts to possess the ring will become possessed by the ring. So what happens when Frodo finally arrives at the Samoth Nour? The entrance into the cracks of doom on Mount Orodruin. I have come, but I will not do the thing I came to do. The ring is mine. Why? He really has no choice in the matter anymore. Okay. So Gandalf starts to tell Frodo about the history of the rings. A mortal Frodo, top of the next page, who keeps one of the great rings does not die, but he does not grow or obtain more life. He merely continues until at last every minute is a weariness. Okay, now compare that with Lord Voldemort. What does Lord Voldemort want? Immortality. He wants to never die. Okay? A mortal who possesses one of the rings will not die. Doesn't necessarily mean, mean he lives more, just doesn't die. Think of Bilbo's feeling like butter stretched over too much bread. And multiply that almost like by infinity. If he often uses the ring to make himself invisible, he fades. He becomes in the end invisible permanently and walks in the twilight under the eye of the dark power. Sooner or later, if he is strong or well-meaning to begin with, but neither strength nor good purpose will last. Sooner or later, the dark power will devour. Now, who does this apply to? Right. Those of mortal race. Who is not mortal? The elves. Are you sure? Can elves die? Yes. yes. <laughs> Will they die on their own naturally? No. They can be killed, but they don't grow old and die. They don't get sick even. But they can be killed. Frodo, how terrifying. How long have you known this? How much did Bilbo know? Okay. So they keep talking. Frodo asks again, how long have you known this? Gandalf, known? I have known much that only the wise know, Frodo. That's a bit of a slam. That's a slap down on Gandalf's part. Because Frodo's asking... Well, golly gee, Mr. Gandalf, how long have you known all this? And Gandalf is saying, whoa, stop here. I'm the mighty wizard. I've been around a long time, about a thousand years or so. And you're a punk. What do you mean? I know much that only the wise know. Okay. But if you mean about the ring, well, I don't know. There's a the last test. But when did I first begin to guess? Yeah. 
Yeah, when Frodo, when, excuse me, when Bilbo got the ring, <laughs> his story didn't quite make up. Okay? So they go on, they talk about Sarah Man. And then Gandalf mentions Sauron and slaves. And Frodo says, but why should we be enslaved? Why would he want such slaves? Why would Sauron in his dark fortress, many miles away from here, want us as slaves? To tell you the truth, I believe that hitherto, hitherto, mark you, he's entirely overlooked the existence of hobbits. But he won't forget you again. And hobbits as miserable slaves would please him far more than hobbits happy and free. There is such a thing as malice and revenge. There is such a thing as malice. What does that mean? There's evil in the world. Yeah, pure, unadulterated evil. But then there's also revenge. What's the difference between malice and revenge? Malice has no one to start with, and malice is, malice is just general hate for everything. Revenge is specific to you. Malice doesn't have to have a motive. Malice could be, you know, somebody shooting you for no good will, no good reason, just kicks. Okay? Revenge is you or somebody you're related to or somebody you know or somebody you think you know did something to me, therefore I'm striking back at you. Okay? Revenge for what? Frodo doesn't understand. What have I done to Sauron? What's all this to do with Bilbo and myself and our ring? Give me the ring for a moment. Notice he doesn't say, give me the ring. Because how could that be construed? Yeah. That could, be, that could mean, give me the ring permanently. Gandalf never does that. He'll say, let me see the ring for a moment. Bilbo offered him the ring, right? No, don't give it to me. Put it on the mantle. So he pulls it out. Gandalf holds it up. You see anything? No, no markings. Look, pitches it in the fire. Frodo squeals. Then Gandalf pulls it out with the tongs, tells Frodo, open your hand. Talk about trust. Talk about faith. I mean, this gold has been sitting in the fire. Gandalf's holding it in tongs. No, no, trust me, Frodo. It won't burn through your hand. It's quite cool, take it. And now they see letters. I can't read them. No, but I can. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. And he says it's just part of a longer verse. And he quotes the entire verse. This is the master ring, the one ring to rule them all. This is the one ring he lost many years ago to the great weakening of his power. He greatly desires it, but he must not get it. Frodo, how on earth did it come to me? What's he really saying? Why me? Why me? I mean, the toy of Satan, and I have it, and he wants it back. Gandalf, well, that's a long story. <laughs> So he goes on and tells him the long story. He talks about the enemy. He talks about the three elven rings. He talks about the nine riders. He talks about Gilgalad and Elendil of Westernessa, who is the son of Erendil. Okay. Talks about the gladden fields and about this creature fishing. One day, who found it named Diagol and his friend named Smeagol and how Smeagol killed Diagol for the ring. And then Smeagol became an outcast and went to live under the mountains. Gollum? Do you mean that this is the very Gollum creature that Bobo met? How loathsome. Notice his first introduction, at least from ben Gandalf, and he says, how loathsome, Gandalf. I think it is a sad story. 
Frodo is repulsed by the story of Gollum, whereas Gandalf feels sorry for Gollum. And it might have happened to others, even to some hobbits that I have known. Well, what's he mean by that? Frodo. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and Frodo. In other words, don't put yourself on such a high pedestal there, Frodo. This could have been you. I can't believe that Gollum was connected with the hobbits, however distantly. Why? Why can't he believe Gollum was ever a hobbit or hobbit-like? Bingo. That's why people today, you know, they do their family history, and they find out 150 years ago their family were slave owners. Okay. You know, most southern families 150 years ago were slave owners. Might have only been one. Unless you're rich, then you had 100 or 1,000 or you know, whatever the number. He doesn't want to admit that he could be like Gollum. It's like people today wanting to say, oh, well, Hitler did all that stuff because he is crazy. Because he had syphilis <laughs> or Mao or Stalin. Well, okay, maybe. Or maybe he was just like your next door neighbor. He wanted power. People will do things when they want power over others. And those things won't necessarily be nice. You need a little bit of applicability? Look at the Republican primaries. I mean, you talk about a mud fest. I, mean, I just saw the latest Mitt Romney ad the other day against Gingrich. It's not pretty. It has nothing to do with the issues confronting America. It has everything to do with Newt Gingrich's personality. And I haven't said I am a Republican. I'm conservative. I'm far right wing. I make Genghis Khan look like a liberal. Okay? Just you know, get that out in the open. Okay? But it's not pretty. Why? Because they want to be president. Personally, anybody wants to be president that bad? <laughs> yeah, and danger involved. Okay? Gandalf, it doesn't matter what you think, Frodo, it's true. How does he know it's true? Because he's talking with Gollum. Okay? So they keep talking. And Gandalf tells him, you ought to begin to understand, Frodo, after all you've heard. He, Gollum, hated it and loved it, as he hated and loved himself, but he could not get rid of it. He had no will left. A reign of power looks after itself, like it has a mind or will of its own. This will become very important because of what happens towards the end of the novel on Mount Doom. But its keeper never abandons it. Skipping a bit, the ring left him. That is, the ring chose to leave Gollum. What? Just in time to meet Bilbo? Notice, Frodo takes that slightly. He makes a joke out of it. Gandalf, it's not funny, Frodo. There was more than one power at work. Okay, so how many powers, let's say, are there? There's the power of the ring, so the ring was at work. There's Sauron's power behind the ring, Sauron willing the ring to come back. The ring was trying to get back to its master. It had slipped from Isildur's hand. It had found Diagol and Smeagol, and it abandoned Gollum. Behind that, there was something else at work beyond any desire of the ringmaker. And if you haven't yet read Boethius, Boethius is getting at what Gandalf is getting at. I could put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker. So if Bilbo was meant to find the ring, who meant for Bilbo to find it? And it's not Sauron. Fate, destiny, there is no such thing as fate and destiny. 
in the Lord of the Rings. But there is Eru Iluvatar, kind of in the background. Or, if you want to use a name from the Silmarillion, there is Manwe. Manwe is the god of Middle Earth. Just let me rephrase that. One of the gods. He's the chief god of Middle Earth. Okay? He'd be our equivalent of Zeus. But above him is God, God. Okay? I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker, in which case you also were meant to have it. And that may be an encouraging thought. What? It's encouraging that I have Satan's plaything? Not necessarily. Frodo's thinking. How is that supposed to be encouraging? Frodo knows nothing about these two. There is no quote-unquote religion at all in Middle Earth. At least as Tolkien shows it to us here. Though you do often hear the elves cry out, Elbreth Gelthoniel. Well, who's Elbreth? His wife. She's the queen of the gods. A lot of people have said she's essentially Mary, Tolkien's Catholic. Okay? In his letters, he talks about the writing of the Lord of the Rings, and he says that the Lord of the Rings is fundamentally, this is a direct quote, it is a fundamentally religious and philosophical work. Less so in origin than in the revising. That is, as he revised and revised and revised, the book became more and more Catholic and philosophical. Why? Because that's how his mind worked. He couldn't escape from that. Okay? Proto, how do you know all this? Or are you just guessing still? Gandalf looks at Frodo and his eyes glint. Okay, when somebody's eyes glint at you, never good. Means you've angered them. Means you've slighted them in some way. I knew much and I have learned much, but I'm not going to give an account of all my doings to you. Again, Gandalf has been around since the end of the previous age. Long time. All right? But he says, the fire writing alone tells us that it's the one ring. And then he goes on and talks about, I've seen Gollum. I've talked to Gollum. In fact, he says, I even had to put the thread of fire on Gollum. When I was editor of a journal titled Myth Lord, largely devoted to Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, I had a, um, a lawyer from the government, actually, send a submission in. This was right after 9-11 like fall of 2001. And his article was essentially, is Gandalf playing the ticking time bomb scenario? And did he use torture on Gollum to get the information he needed? You know, because he says, I had to put the threat of fire on him. Doesn't say that he burned him, that he did torture him. Okay. We turned down the article for a variety of reasons. But they keep talking, and Frodo finally says, after Gandalf says, Sauron now knows the ring has been discovered. He may be seeking the Shire because he knows of the Shire, and he even knows the name of Baggins. Because Gollum went down looking for the ring, got captured by Sauron's forces, and was tortured by Sauron. Frodo, page 59 or so. But this is terrible. Far worse than the worst that I imagined from your hints and warnings. O oh, Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really afraid. Notice what his motivation is. What am I to do? What a pity Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Why is it a pity that Bilbo did not stab Gollum when he had the chance? 
because I'm afraid. <laughs> That's why. And if Gollum had been stabbed nearly 80 years ago, Frodo wouldn't be here this morning. He'd still be fat, dumb, and happy. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy. Not to strike without need. If you've read The Hobbit, when Fro uh, Bilbo has his chance, rather than stabbing Gollum, he jumps over him. Makes it a little bit harder, because he could have just gutted him. But he doesn't. Why? Because he doesn't need to. He has another way out. And he has been well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure that he took so little hurt from the evil. The evil of the ring. And escaped in the end because he began his ownership of the ring so. With pity. Okay, notice the emphasis Gandalf is putting on pity. Now, what's the difference between pity and mercy? Pity is a feeling. Pity is an emotion. Mercy is an action. When you feel pity for someone, you feel sorry for them. When you are merciful to someone, what are you doing? Judgment you are withholding judgment. You are in some shape, manner, or form helping them. The help might be not putting them to death, giving them a life sentence. Or you're driving down the road. You see some homeless guy at the begin, the on-ramp for, you know, the highway. Disabled vet, hungry, help. Pity is, oh, it's too bad. Whoosh, and you get on the on-ramp and you drive on your merry way. Mercy is stopping, pulling out your wallet, and handing them some money. Or what would be even more merciful would be going back to a McDonald's, getting them something to eat, and bringing that to them. Huge difference. So Gandalf says, it was this that Bilbo began his ownership of the ring. And he practiced this by not killing Gollum. I'm sorry, but I'm frightened. I do not feel any pity for Gollum. Notice, why doesn't he feel any pity? Because he is scared. How applicable is that to our own lives? How often do we feel pity when we are in a state of fear? Not usually. Because what are you doing when you are in a state of fear? You're looking after yourself. Yeah, you are looking out for yourself. You know, get out of my way so I can get out of the room or building before the building collapses. If you heard anything about the Italian cruise ship that ran aground, near Tuscany over the weekend? What did the crew do? Many of them, the captain, they got on the lifeboats first. What's, you know, one of the first laws of the sea? Captain goes down with the ship. Okay. And there were even cases of, you know, where the crew was trying to do their job, getting women and children on lifeboats first. And some men saying, no, why them, not me? Now, some of the men were saying, no, the family goes as a unit or not at all. Some people could you know, understand that. But others saying, no, screw the women and children. I've got a life. I want to live. No pity and mercy there. Okay. All right, we've got to stop there. We will pick up with, I do not feel any pity for Gollum.